the imminent excitement is the fact that it's going to transform fairly rapidly now from this state into a... And everybody's been asking on the colour, and it is going... It's been a massive landmark week this week because we have 100% completed metalwork on the car which has been a long old process and towards the end particularly it just seemed like oh we've only got a few details left to finish <laughs> then we do another solid week of work and then it's only only a few more details but we got there um, and then you know once we completed the metalwork we were happy with that moved the shell into our blasting room blasted the shell um, carried out the uh, metal spray zinc process that we do on the underside, uh, epoxy prime the outside of it, uh, and yeah, it's in the body prep area, uh, waiting for, well, in fact, already started um, work on pre prepping it for paint. So it's in Mark and Gaz's hands now. They're starting with the seam sealing work and they're going to push it through to paint, which is probably one of the single most exciting transformations we'll see on the car. One of the first things we tackled. Um, since we last did the video was the dry sump tank and provision for that on the car uh, which tied in with with lots of other work we were doing which is all related to plumbing and wiring and, and preparing the shell so that once it's painted and we start assembling it we've got hopefully none or very minimal drilling and cutting to do on the shell uh, so the dry sump tank was a biggie we are going to put that in this front corner here um, due to the, the constraints of everything else exhaust manifold sitting up here radiator here there's no room over the other side because the, the air box sits taking up this whole space here in fact this gusset that we've done in the corner here is sculpted basically to sit just really tight on the carbon air box that sits along here um, so the only space available really is here because we didn't want to run it in the boot there's a certain capacity we want the dry sump tank to be um, so making it uh, the right shape to fit in the space we've got and have the capacity and have all the other elements that you want from a dry sump tank, which Nat will probably be able to tell you a bit more about, um, meant that we ended up designing a complete tank from scratch to sit in this area here. We've sculpted out the inner wing so that the tank sits sort of partially recessed at the bottom here, just so we could get the volume on the tank. It doesn't go too far in because you can't go too far before you get close to the wheel when it's on full lock here. Um, so what we did was we sort of worked with the space we've got. We did a CAD model of the tank and how we're going to make it because it's going to have a billet machined top uh, and base and then the sort of fabricated sides that will go between. Um, and another factor was that we wanted to hide the plumbing as much as possible. So we did a CAD model and then we made a, a, a steel fabricated mock-up. Just <laughs> It looks like a thinnest tin or something, but uh, essentially this will be a billet section at the top here and there's going to be an inlet inlet to it here uh, which then has an integral swirl arrangement built into that billet section on the top and the outlet will be near the base there'll also be a drain and temperature probe holes in the base and then there'll be a vent, a vent system built into the billet top with an outlet at the side here um, and the reason we've done this extended section here is basically so when that's slotted into here uh, this sits under the slam panel We've actually made a slightly fabricated raised section here just so we could get the height on the tank and still lay it out the way we wanted. Um, but then that means that the inlet, the return oil to the tank, is actually under here. And the pipe literally comes straight out 90 degrees down to the cooler. Other side of the cooler, we've already planned the, the pipe work for that. We've already got holes in, the, in the, this bulkhead panel down there for where that routes forward. Um, then the outlet from the tank shoots straight across behind the radiator here. And the vent pipe, which is why we've done this slightly raised section here, goes out through the inner wing here. And then we've got four studs on the underside of this inner wing, which will mount uh, a breather tank, which will sit here in one of the few <laughs> remaining available spaces above where the wheel sits and behind the headlight. Uh, and that will be the, the breather vent tank from the dry sump system.
I've mm. decided to design a dry sump tank to suit the car, mainly because of a lack of space, partially because of it looking neat, uh, but mainly because there's no space in the engine bay. Traditionally, a dry sump tank would, on an Escort, would go in the boot, um, but that's not really ideal on a road car because it means the hot oil lines have either got to go inside the car or under the car, and under the car on a, just a daily use road car, they're potentially a bit prone to damage. Uh, and through inside the car, it's not going to be very pleasant from a heat inside the car point of view. Inside that, there's a, a round section. I've not completely drawn that bit yet. But if I turn off the various other bits of the drawing, you'd be able to see that. The oil, the oil will be returned from the engine via the oil cooler in the front panel, then in through a threaded fitting into there, and that goes inside there. Oil will squirt in there and then spin around inside this tube which this tube the tube will be welded on that will be that that section there will be billet this this piece here will be billet this piece will be a piece of tube welded to that billet probably just stitch welded on um, so the oil will come in spin down that drop out of the bottom of that tube or make its way down the walls of that tube it probably won't be a neat spin it'll just sort of spin just sort of blur around the outside of it and drop off the bottom um, where it drops off the bottom of that, it'll drop into a compartment of the tank, which is TIG welded around there onto that, set, onto that piece of billet. So if I turn that on, so that's the tank body fabrication. That, that tube will drop the oil onto the top of this baffle. That baffle will go all the way across. There'll be a big round hole in that baffle in line with this main part of the tank, which again will be welded to it. Um, within that, there'll be a second baffle with a big hole in the middle as well. So all the oil will run down there into this section, down through there, and then the oil will live in there just below the, the height of this top baffle. There'll be an, a second baffle in there just to stop it surging around too much, not that it will very much anyway. And there'll be a hole, the holes in the baffles will line up so that, the, you, and there'll be a hole in this top piece as well, which wasn't shown, so that you can actually see all the way down inside the tank to check the level and that sort of thing. Um, and then if I turn on the base, then there's a billet base. In fact, if I turn the rest off, you'll be able to see. So you can now see that's the base. Inside the base, there's two bosses. That's machine from billet again. There's two bosses there which are threaded underneath and will have pins threaded into them to mount the bottom of the tank onto the um, anti-roll bar mount chass chassis rail in the front of the car. Um, and then that's the main oil outlet which feeds the dry sump pump. You have to remember on the Cosworth engine, the dry sump pump is internal inside the engine. Um, so that will basically feed a pipe which runs across the bottom of the radiator, around along the chassis rail, and then straight onto the side of the sump to the oil inlet. And from there, the pump inside the engine will be drawing that oil that's coming from the tank, pumping it around the engine. Um, those three, one, one of those is an oil drain, one of those, uh, the other two are temperature sensor holes, or whatever we want to use them for, but the, the plan was for two temperature sensors, because there poten there's potentially two reasons we need them, one for the gauge, one for the um, engine management, um, and the third hole just as a, a drain plug, make it easier than taking the pipe off or taking a sensor out, it just, it's just an a, additional oil drain point. Um, so that's that, if I turn the rest back on again, um, that's, actually, I'll just turn the top on. That's the top, that's the lid on the top of the tank. With that off, you can then clean out the top part of the tank and also see all the way down to the bottom of the tank. So you can rinse it all out and see right down to the bottom. If you get a load of bits of engine inside it, hopefully we won't. <laughs> if you did, it will be possible to see down into the bottom of the tank, wash it out with solvent and confirm that there's definitely no bits left in the bottom. So that's that. If I, again, if I turn the rest of the tank back on again, it all sort of makes sense at that point. You can see how that's all linked together. And when it's fitted in the car, Carl's probably already explained, but that, that piece there then sticks through the hole in the front panel, gets fed with the oil from the oil cooler, centrifuge drops in down there, that bit holds the oil, fed off to the engine and then breather in there and an oil filler cap. Again, we've got to finalise the filler cap design and a few little bits and bobs and I've got some more holes to add and a few tweaks to do to the design before it goes off for machining. Um, but that's, that's the basics of it. Um, I'm sure there are other ways to solve the problem, but it does look pretty trick. <laughs> It'll be quite a neat solution uh, and something a bit different as well. And then kind of moving on from that, 
it was making provision for all of the other plumbing and wiring and that was that was a kind of biggie that we wanted to get through now again so we're not having to chop around the shell too much once it's painted or hopefully not at all um, so all of the plumbing fuel plumbing uh, brake plumbing oil lines uh, the coolant plumbing including the heater circuit uh, and all the wiring routing has all been planned at this stage so we can make relevant changes so if you look in the engine bay here you'll see various holes that we've made the two down there are for the heater plumbing there's going to be uh, aluminium bulkhead fittings through there which then join to the rubber hose, hose work to go to the engine into the heater uh, over this side these are going to be the engine management uh, wiring we're going to build a loom um, ourselves for this which is going to have bulkhead connectors so the ECU and the inside of the car part of the engine loom will be separate from the engine loom that's on the engine itself and there'll be Deutsch Autosport connectors actually bolted to the bulkhead here and here so you can essentially unplug two plugs and that separates the whole engine loom from the car um, and we've done that on all of the bulkhead connections both pipes and wiring so there are no pipes or wiring passing through rubber grommets in the bulkhead it's all connectors onto the bulkhead um, looking over at the other side uh, there is a hole under here which is where the front part of the main chassis loom comes through and that again that's on a Deutsch uh, auto sport connector which is a bulkhead connector kind of military spec stuff and that means we've got the the, the sort of in main car wiring loom coming up the inside to a, a socket here and then the front end of the wiring loom will plug on here and then we've got holes running here where there'll be rib nuts fitted for clips to hold that wiring at the front here where we couldn't put holes through because they would have been the, we don't want to see the back of the rib nuts on the inside of here we've welded little studs onto the inner wing so that'll clip the wiring down to here and then that routing continues all the way there's all there's always studs or rib nut holes wherever we're going to route the wiring across the front there So also fuel uh, system plumbing has been completely done. Uh, we're going to have a pressure regulator mounted down here. We've put holes in for threaded inserts where that's going to mount. And then the, the hose routing up to the fuel rail, because uh, it's so tight here. We're coming up to here with bulkhead connectors through these two holes here. And then we'll have 90 degree fittings on there, which will just sweep round behind the airbox to the fuel rail, one obviously to the front, the other to the back. Um, and then we've done threaded inserts or holes for them all the way down the chassis legs for the fuel, rail, uh, fuel lines to run to the boot where the rest of the fuel system is uh, and a little bit of provision here for a couple of tanks that side we're going to have a fabricated um, reservoir for the brake and clutch system two holes down there where the unions are going to pass through that feed the master cylinders which are inside uh, this side we wanted to try and keep the symmetry so we've come up with a, a funky idea for the screen wash reservoir so we'll have a small reservoir here which matches exactly the brake and clutch reservoir except it'll have a large union going down through here with a hose feeding a large tank in the passenger footwell which will effectively be also the passenger's foot rest except it'll be deep and have a reservoir for the screen wash which would be quite a large reservoir then but then it keeps it all looking completely symmetrical up here and this will be where you fill the reservoir but it then feeds down into a into the passenger's footrest um that's probably about everything sort of at the front of the car moving on to the back various changes since we last talked about it again you generally re involving fuel system wiring that sort of thing uh, we've done the mounts down here for the battery tray battery will sit here we've also made provision for where the battery cable is going to route where it passes through and where it's clipped along right to the front uh, fuel tank the plan has always as we've previously discussed been to put the tank here we've now put some mounting points in there there up there and over there which is how the tank will be mounted and then these holes here are for the threaded inserts that will hold the clamps that hold the fuel pump and the fuel filter and the idea is that the tank actually overhangs to where these mounts are here and we'll have a trim panel coming down the back of the tank 
which will then also hide the fuel pump and filter away there. And they feed off to some bulkhead fittings here, which is where the fuel lines pass to underneath. And they're clipped along all the way to the pressure regulator at the front. Um, what else at the back? Ah, yeah, because the fuel system or the fuel tank and the pump and filter are all in the boot, we wanted to totally separate the uh, air in the boot from the air in the car. So we've made some fabricated pieces as an aluminium piece that bonds in um, underneath here, or will do after we've painted it, which, which means that the ventilation from the rear shelf passes through to this area here and exhausts out the back, but doesn't connect into the boot, which it does as standard. Uh, and also we've made some fabricated aluminium panels that sit down each side here, which again will be bonded in after paint, and they completely separate then the, the cockpit air from the boot air. I think in terms of things in the boot, there's the fuel system, which we've talked about, we talked before about the fact that the sort of anti-surge pot in the tank will drop down here. So all of that plumbing has been mocked up where it comes out of the bottom of the pot, around to the pump, to the filter, and then through those bulkhead fittings there, and then the return one will just come out there and straight to, straight to the bottom of that tank there. Um, so no, that's, that's about it really. One of the other sort of final jobs was just doing the lead filling on the pillars, basically on all the original factory joints. So at the scuttle here, both sides, top of the A pillars, uh, the top of the C pillars and where the C pillar meets the rear scuttle area. Um, that was all lead filled and body filed back to the shape. Um, we did a little bit of lead filling elsewhere. There was some, some slight shape of the pillar here we weren't mad keen on. So we just crisped that up a little bit with a bit of lead there. And also on the scuttle here, where we leaded across here, there's a, there's a seam join there, um, which is nice to leave because you, you, it kind of looks original rather than in like it's been bodged with filler. But it's very easy for a join like that on exterior, even if you seam seal it, for it to either look messy or to crack and get rust creeping out afterwards. So we actually leaded that join and then carved the seam back in through the lead. So, it, so there's not a gap down there, it's completely sealed, no chance of rust coming out, but it still looks crisp and original. Um, and that was kind of the final thing on this side. And if we flip it over and have a look at the underside, we can have a look at some of the, the details on the underside. Mark, you want to just come and flip it back again? Let's go. Yeah. Should we play some uh, Baywatch music? <laughs> or Top Gun? Right, go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 keep going on to the bar. So with the car this way, um, first thing that strikes you really is the fact that it's bright silver, which is the zinc spray process we've done on the underside. We've also started doing the, the initial seam sealing, which is what the, the sort of yellowy stuff is, seam sealer that we've started doing. But the zinc spray process is something that we started doing a few years back now to try and give incredibly high standards of corrosion resistance. And it's literally, it's basically a, a, a gun that has an oxypropane feed to it and a compressed air feed to it, and then literally a solid wire of zinc feeding into the gun. And it literally liquefies and sprays molten zinc. It's a process quite often used on sort of offshore wind turbines, uh, oil rigs, bridges, that sort of thing. Um, and because of the nature of, uh, of zinc, it's kind of a sacrificial protection. So even if, even if the zinc gets scratched all the way through to the steel, it still, the steel doesn't rust. The zinc, the zinc still protects it, even though it's not in direct contact with it. So it's a pretty good process. And we, we will eventually go over this with a urethane coating, um, tinted body colored, which will be the kind of final finish on it, which is also incredibly stone chip resistant. Um, but yeah, zinc spray done, which was immediately after a, a fresh blast, which we do all over the shell, just to clean it, completely clean it up to perfect bare steel again. Um, then we do the zinc spray, um, but what we can also see with it this way up is all of the other provision we've made for running fuel lines and that kind of thing. So on the inside edges of these chassis legs there are holes for rib nuts to be put into after it's painted, which is where we'll clip uh, brake lines, fuel lines. Um, you can see sort of the underside of the holes where we're going to put inserts in for the fuel pump and filter inside the boot. Um, we did a change here, the original spring shackles. We actually left these um, untouched. And that was one thing that um, was mentioned when Gordon last came over was that it looked a bit untidy with those kind of redundant spring shackle mounts there. So we've kind of just capped off these end parts here to make it look a little tidier there. That's probably it really. You can see obviously the masses of changes we've made to the shell, particularly at the back there. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, the big change you can see really is the fact that it's now back to clean metal and then been had the zinc spray done, and this is kind of leading onto it being painted, which is progressing remarkably fast. It was only a day ago that we, you know, yesterday, in fact, we did the blast and zinc spray. We're already cracking on with the with the seam sealing and starting the prep work on the outside of the shell. Seam sealing, it's it's because you'll get water ingress creeping in, and that's you know one place. All of the process, processes we do are relatively line of sight in terms of spray, uh, sprayed applications. Now, the final thing we'll do is wax inject all the hollow sections, and we make sure that's thinned down to a point that when it's hot, it seeps into all of the, all of the sort of nooks and crannies. But certainly water ingress into, into sort of closed seams like that is a, a big killer on kind of on cars generally particularly restored ones that you know that's something that especially if a car's been dipped which is one of the reasons we do blasting and not dipping because we have had cars dipped in the past and one thing you do tend to find is that that sort of close close area where the two seams are together is always an area that traps traps rust and you get that creeping out later on uh, the other thing we forgot to mention is the uh, seam brazing that's been done on the whole shell. I mean, Gordon was mad keen on making sure the shell was as stiff as possible. So the final thing we did before it was blasted was go around every seam on the shell uh, and TIG braze those seams. And Nat, Nat's done that. And um, he, he basically does this TIG brazing process because A, braze is a little softer than just welding it. So it's less likely to crack. Um, and applying it with a TIG torch just minimises the amount of heat that has to be put in, less chance of distortion uh, in the surrounding area. So every seam has been stitched with TIG braze to stiffen up the shell, and that was the, the very last step before blasting it and zinking it. The imminent excitement is the fact that it's going to transform fairly rapidly now from this state into a... And everybody's been asking on the colour, and it is going white. We did, I think we did say that earlier on, I'm not sure. I think we said in one of the planning design episodes, it's going ermine white, which is an original Ford white. It's quite, quite a creamy white, but yeah, it's going to look great. So that's exciting. Yeah, yeah, his last visit, he, I think he was, he was obviously in a very deep in thought last time, and, and it was very nerve-wracking because he was leaving huge pauses, but he was taking everything in, and he was obviously happy at the end. And I know he had a, bit, a meeting after, which was probably on his mind a bit. But yeah, he wrote us a letter uh, not too long after that, you know, saying he really enjoyed the visit and was impressed with the car. So that was really nice. And he gave us a little, a little present for the, for the workshop. For, so yeah, that was a nice touch, really. Handwritten postcard from Gordon Murray, always good. <laughs>